It's Tuesday, August 15th. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. And today we're going to take a deep dive into the United Airlines Flight 1722, which came within 748 feet of the ocean while on departure out of Maui's airport back in December of 2022. Let's check it out. Okay, 1800. So the view from the outside of the aircraft, it was not until they saw this view of the clouds rushing by and a glimpse of the ocean right about here they realized it's sea fit recover flaps up nose up 20 degrees full power and escape The final NTSB report is out and it corroborates very closely to our first report on this incident uh, earlier this year about a miscommunication regarding the flap settings on the aircraft which led to this undesirable state of getting within 748 feet of the ocean on, while on departure. And if we scroll down to page 3, probable cause and findings, the NTSB determines the probable cause to be the flight crew's failure to manage the airplane's vertical flight path, airspeed, and pitch attitude following a miscommunication about the captain's desired flap setting during the initial climb. So let's dig deeper into the public docket and find out not only how this happened, but why this happened. Shortly before the NTSB releases a final report, they normally release the public docket, and in here are the pages and pages of all the data that the NTSB has gathered from which they make their final report. So let's dive into this public docket. But one of the things that's missing from the public docket is the CVR or cockpit voice recorder data. Remember, this incident happened back in December. The crew realized that they had oversped the flaps, more on that in a minute, and so Anytime you have an exceedance on one of these aircraft, the systems on board the aircraft immediately flag that data and notify gatekeepers that there has been an exceedance. So the crew knew that this was the case, and so they filed their report as soon as they were within 24 hours of landing. They filed their own individual reports with the company and explained to the company what happened. Their reports corroborated very closely with the NTSB investigation. But the NTSB did not initially get involved with this because, because the pilots made their reports. Their reports jived with the data that was on board the aircraft. Corrections were made. And then it was not until the ADSB data was discovered by uh, folks that watch ADSB data. And that report came out on a aviation website. It was only until then that the NTSB got involved. By then, of course, the cockpit voice recorder had been overwritten, but they were able to recover much of the rest of the necessary data and good statements from the crews that explain exactly what happened. And I want to make clear that the initial reports that the pilots filed with the company are private and remain private. But now that the NTSB public docket is now public information, we can review the NTSB public information. So let's first start with this incident report here where they go into talking about the pilots and the um, pilots experience and the aircraft involved. The aircraft involved was a Boeing 777-200, which has a maximum gross weight of 554,000 pounds. Uh, weight at the time of uh, the incident was 462,000 pounds with a total passenger seating capacity of 364 seats, 381 seats total counting the crews, but doesn't tell us how many passengers were on board at the time with a maximum rated thrust on the Pratt & Whitney engines of 77,000 pounds each. Now, what about the pilot crew members' experience? This often comes up in discussions. Was this caused by a lack of experience? Well, kind of. If we look at the captain's information, which he gave to the NTSB, he's got 19,600 hours of total time. He's got 5,000 hours in the Boeing 777, but as pilot in command of the Boeing 777, he only has 300 hours. So what this means is 
He spent uh, 5,000 hours in the right seat of the Boeing 777, and this is a common career progression where you sit in the right seat of the 777 and you got to wait for your seniority until a slot opens up where you can become the captain of the Boeing 777 and get a nice pay raise in so doing. Now, in the case of this captain, what I'm interested in and what the NTSB doesn't talk about is Airbus A320, his type ratings. This is a very familiar career path that I had as well. I spent a lot of my time on the Boeing 7576 aircraft and then went to the Airbus A320 series of aircraft and then came back to the Boeing 777. Did this captain spend a lot of time on the Airbus in between his right seat in the Boeing 777 and his left seat in the Boeing 777? The point is Airbus aircraft handle completely, well, they handle considerably different than Boeing aircraft. They are designed considerably different than Boeing aircraft. And the way that Airbus aircraft continuously trim the flight controls while you are operating the joystick controller is considerably different than how a Boeing aircraft flight controls operate, whereas a Boeing aircraft's flight controls operate very much like a real airplane. Even though they're fly-by-wire, whatever control inputs you put into the Boeing aircraft with whatever out-of-trim inputs you put into the Boeing aircraft, it will follow. Whereas the Airbus aircraft with the fly-by-wire joystick controller, wherever you point the joystick basically or the flight director if you will it will hold a um it will trim the aircraft up for you more automatically than a boeing aircraft so we have a fairly new to the left seat captain in the left seat and in the right seat we've got a pilot with 5300 hours total time and just 120 hours in make and model of the Boeing 777. So a fairly new guy in the right seat of the Boeing 777. And with 5,300 hours, I suspect that he's a fairly new hire to the company overall. And we're seeing even first assignment um, assignments being assigned to new hires right into the wide body aircraft because of the pilot shortage and the demand for pilots in the industry. By the way, there are provisions in the scheduling program to prevent two brand new guys from being scheduled together on the same flight. They must have a minimum number of hours before they can be scheduled together. Kahului Airport is a relatively short runway for the Boeing 777 coming in at just 6,998 feet for runway 02 or runway 20. This flight was departing on runway 02. Now let's go through the pilot's report starting with the captain. Remember, this is public information based off of the NTSB public docket. I was the captain on the flight acting as the pilot flying. Remember, we always have a flying pilot and a um, monitoring pilot. And those divisions can be split up between the two seats and they're usually split up each leg. Maui was experiencing heavy rain and gusty winds at the time. I received a briefing through the dispatcher about the weather threats that afternoon. We eventually agreed upon an alternate route that might help with the weather. Upon arriving to the aircraft, uh, they talked to the purser and talked about the turbulence that they were going to be experiencing, and he briefed him on that. There was no maintenance issues with the aircraft. The general condition of the aircraft was acceptable. During the pre-flight, the FO made me aware of an incident. Remember this? Earlier that morning involving a Hawaiian Airlines aircraft experiencing seeing a possible severe turbulence event upon descent. Remember, that was the Hawaiian Airlines uh, aircraft. I believe he was coming into Honolulu, and that buildup just blew up in front of them faster than they could climb or get out of its way, and they ended up plowing into this buildup that was building very rapidly and um, had a severe turbulence event. I believe it was injuring some folks, too. We discussed this event and the needed additional vigilance for the, not only the takeoff, and but climb as well into the convective conditions that Maui was still experiencing. The FO had difficulty receiving the ATIS and had to call ground to get the current weather. Maui was indeed experiencing heavy rain, but the winds were relatively calm below 10 knots with runway 20 in use. The FO has extensive experience flying in the Hawaiian Islands. Now that's probably on an aircraft before the 777 and made mention, which makes me wonder how much experience does the captain have in flying out of Maui, and made mention of how unusual it was to use runway 20. Yeah, you usually take off on a runway 02 into the trade winds. 
We completed our normal briefing before pushback and added the specifics about the weather threats for the takeoff and climb out. Sabre performance returned a flaps 20. This is the TPS or the takeoff performance chart. Returned a flaps 20 with a reduced thrust setting. Bing, bing, bing. This is a big distraction for the crew. Normally, we are used to doing flaps 15 takeoffs in the Boeing 777. But because of the short runway and the gusty wind conditions, they have to use a flaps 20 setting. A very, well, a not very often used flap setting on the Boeing 777. We briefed PWS and wind shear precautions as well, and now runway 02 was in use. So they're distracted with all the wind shear advisories going on. They're going over in their minds the wind shear escape maneuver, as, as they've been taught so many times in the simulator. But now, fortunately, the normal runway 02 is back in use, so one less distraction. Before we go too much further, quick review of flaps on the Boeing 777-200. The flaps have a series of notches which result in flap settings of up, flaps 1, which only extends the leading edge slats, flaps 5, flaps 15, flaps 20, flaps 25, and flaps 30. That would be your full flap setting. Normally for landing, you're using either flaps 25 or 30. If you're using a single engine landing, you'll be using flaps 20. Normally for takeoff, you have a selection of either flaps 5, flaps 15, or flaps 20 for takeoff. Normally on takeoff, we are used to using flaps 15. And when we go to retract the flaps from flaps 15, we bring it up to the next gate of flaps 5. Here's where it talks about the authorized flap settings on the 200 for takeoff, 5, 15, and 20. Not to be confused with the 300 ER, and when you're normally checked out in the Boeing 777, you're qualified to fly either of these two aircraft. On the 300, you're only using flaps 15 or 20 for takeoff. Now each of these flap settings has a speed limit associated with it. These placarded speeds are located right on the instrument panel to help remind you to not overspeed the flaps, and these speed Speed limits are also shown on the tape, the airspeed tape, while you're flying the aircraft and while the flaps are moving. With help from summer intern Kellen, we were able to download a Boeing 777 into Microsoft Flight Sim 2020 and take a go at this. And we'll play this at the um, towards the end of this video here. But here's what those airspeed air speeds flap speeds look like on the airspeed tape you see the flaps five speed there versus our current speed there's the flaps one speed and then there's the red tape showing the flap limit speed right there and there's the flap up speed just above 260 knots in this case now here's the foot stomper here is the point of confusion of this entire episode and as a new pilot on the boeing 777 you may not remember this from your training. Normally we take off with flaps 15. When we go to retract the flaps, when that speed bug hits the flaps 15 mark, we retract the flaps to the next gate or flaps five. Then when the speed accelerates to the flaps five speed, you call for flaps one and you, the pilot monitoring retracts the flaps to flaps one and so on until you get the flaps completely retracted. Now. For the unusual takeoff with flaps 20, which the crew had to do out of Maui, once the speed hits the flaps 20 speed, you call for flaps five and the pilot not flying or the pilot monitoring retracts the flaps past the flaps 15 gate up to the flaps five gate. You do not normally stop at the flaps 15 gate. You bring it all the way from flaps 20 to flaps five. Same thing, by the way, on a single engine go around, you are doing the approach at flaps 20, you do a single engine go around, you call once the speed gets to flaps 20, and you call for and retract the flaps to flaps five. And then you proceed as normal. Now that our memories are all refreshed from the comfort of our couch, let's jump back into the heat of the battle that these guys were facing. From the captains, back to the captains, a description. During taxi out, there were several aircraft ahead of us and ground control made a call about low level wind shear advisories now in effect and several aircraft inbound experiencing gains and losses in airspeed. 
I elected to do a max thrust takeoff instead of a reduced power takeoff and we verbally reviewed the predictive wind shear and active wind shear recovery procedures. Okay, so they've, they've got wind shear procedure. They are geared up for wind shear procedures. They know the recovery from what they've been practicing in the simulator, and they also need to now select maximum power. Remember, each and every one of these uh, takeoffs in these airliner aircraft are engineered such that you can safely lose an engine at the worst possible moment, takeoff decision speed, continue the takeoff and stagger around the pattern on one engine at that power setting and bring it back and land at that weight and airport. The whole idea of using reduced power is saving wear and tear in the engines. The engines are leased from other companies and you get a longer lease that way. But there are certain conditions that you are forced to use full power and this is one of them, low level wind shear advisories in effect. And so they have to recalculate, they have to reset the FMS to max thrust for the takeoff. So that's a distraction for the FO to deal with. There is also a potential correction of the uh, takeoff speeds, but they elect not to do that. Just use the reduced power takeoff speeds, which is allowed by the book. But what this means is that with maximum power, you're going to be reaching those flap limit speeds even faster than you would with reduced power. It's easier to overspeed the flaps on takeoff during flap retraction with a max power takeoff, especially in turbulent conditions, than it is at a reduced power takeoff. We were given clearance to line up and wait on runway 02 behind an Airbus A321 that had just departed, weather radar was on, and we held for approximately two to three minutes in position. This gives the crew a chance to really look at the corridor ahead for uh, weather on the weather radar while they're sitting there waiting. During takeoff roll, I had my windshield wipers on high for the heavy rain. That's, that's a lot of rain. Acceleration was rapid, yet we had no non-normal airspeed fluctuations noted by the FO. That's his job to notice that because they're all geared up for wind shear problems. And if there's a massive fluctuation in the uh, airspeed before you reach uh, your takeoff decision speed, you got to reject the takeoff. Rotation and initial climb were normal, but as soon, but we soon began to encounter rapid airspeed fluctuations with light turbulence that became more moderate as we climbed. I noticed the aircraft reach thrust reduction and acceleration altitude, which were the same in this case. So usually about a thousand feet above the ground, it's time to start retracting the flaps. The auto throttles, remember, are engaged via the toga button for takeoff that pushes the throttles all the way up to maximum power. And then at a thousand feet, the auto throttles will automatically come back to the climb power predetermined setting, at which time the you lower the nose and you begin retracting the flaps. I noticed the aircraft reached thrust reduction, acceleration altitude, which is the same in this case. And I lowered the nose slightly to begin acceleration. I called for flaps five. Remember, that's the correct call out. You go from flaps 20 to flaps 5. And notice the VMO MMO, the red tape on the airspeed indicator, moved opposite to my expectation toward the speed bug instead of away from the speed bug. In other words, the red line came closer to his current speed. Airspeed began to accelerate rapidly. Well, remember this was a max thrust takeoff. That thrust is beginning to come back plus the turbulent conditions. And based on the rate of increase, I anticipated a flap overspeed. I reduced the power manually, overriding the auto throttle servos, but, but not enough to incur a reversal in the IVSI towards descent. In other words, reverse from a climb to a descent. VSI, vertical speed indicator. But we were still in a positive climb. The reduction in power was to reduce the extent of the flap overspeed and slow the airspeed acceleration trend. We ended up overspeeding the flaps by approximately 10 to 15 knots, as I recall. And again, this will all automatically be flagged by the FOQA data on board the aircraft. My next cause of action was to quickly find out the status of the flaps and if, they, and if there was a mechanical failure. So now they're going from wind shear concerns to the possibility of having a flap problem. So he's distracted and looking over to see what's going on with the flap lever setting. 
I glanced over to the flap indicator and noticed the flaps were set to 15 instead of 5 as I had asked for. I would note that the selection of retracting flaps from 20 to 5 is normal and acceptable line operation procedure. In other words, that's what the book says. In my experience, most common, however. However, to the best of my knowledge, there are no flight manual restrictions on retracting the flaps from 20 to 15. But that's not what the book says. So there were no ICAST messages or chimes noted at the time. That's right. The aircraft's not going to say you're doing anything particularly wrong. I immediately called again for flaps five and repeated the call at least once more. Now, when we get to the FO side of the story, you're going to see that he's busy dealing with the radios at this time. I saw the FO's hand move toward the flap handle and made the selection. There were no abrupt or excessive control inputs made at any time, but I noticed the aircraft in an immediate and significant nose down attitude with a slight bank. Airspeed was rising rapidly, and I began to hear the Egypt whiz ground proximity warning system call terrain, terrain, pull up. As I began a pull on the control wheel to get the nose back above the horizon on the PFD, I initially reduced power to reduce airspeed acceleration, which is actually a good thing. Cornering speed, you want to get maximum cornering speed, get your pull started, and then, then hit it with the power. Take care to make sure the speed brakes were still stowed as well. Once I noticed the rapid change in IVSI towards a climbing trend, I lowered the nose toward the flight director commands to resume the normal profile. Well, in a minute. I don't recall when the flaps were requested to move to position one, but I did call for the flaps to be completely retracted. And after the after takeoff checklist shortly thereafter, the autopilot was soon engaged as well. We resumed the climb and were immediately faced with the expected threats of continued moderate turbulence and weather deviations as we continued our climb. So back to this point here, I quickly reversed into full power to the stop to begin the full CFIT recovering maneuver. That's 20 degrees nose up and full power speed brakes retracted. So they spent the remainder of the flight debriefing the incident and figuring out how they're gonna write their reports to the company and they landed uneventfully at San Francisco. They were met by the mechanic because they had already got the <laughs> overspeed information sent to them automatically and briefed them on the details of the aircraft condition and flap overspeed. So the, that would require an inspection of the aircraft. Now let's switch over to the uh, FO's version of events, picking it up at the climb out of 1200 feet and shows you just how busy the pilot not flying is. While the pilot flying is flying the aircraft, the pilot not flying is doing everything else. Climbing through about 1,200 feet, I heard the captain announce flaps 15. The captain says he said flaps 5. The FO heard flaps 15. We don't have the CVR anymore to verify which was which, but the FO had it in his mind that they were going to go from flaps 20 to flaps 15. I heard the captain announce flaps 15 as Maui Tower switched us to departure. I selected flaps 15 and checked in with departure climbing through 1400 feet into IMC or into the goo, into the clouds. Departure control responded climb and maintain 16,000 feet and advised moderate to extreme precipitation all quadrants and any weather deviations were approved. I noticed our airspeed was holding just below VFE of 178 knots, just below the red zipper, the flap limit speed. Then he had to go and select weather on the EFIS control panel because now both of them are on weather, whereas on the initial takeoff, one of them can be in weather and the other one is required to be in terrain. And then adjusted the altitude in the window on the MCP to 16,000 feet, the clearance. At this point, we were climbing through 2,000 feet, and I noticed our pitch slowly decreasing, but still maintaining a positive pitch angle. The following happened within 10 to 15 seconds, and you'll see that when uh, Kellen and I jump in this, the uh, Microsoft Flight Sim, just how quick this develops. The captain announced flaps 5, and I heard don't sink at the same time. The pitch angle decreased further towards zero degree pitch angle, in other words, nose on the horizon, and our airspeed increased rapidly through the current flap speed limit. At this point, I knew the captain was having difficulty with airspeed control, and I noticed our pitch turned to a negative pitch angle. 
I queried the captain on what was happening. I couldn't be certain what the captain was dealing with. Since I saw no wind shear indications, remember this is what they're keyed for on the departure. Is this a wind shear event? And this is very <laughs> similar to how wind shear events are taught in the simulator. It's usually on departure and you get a big sink going on. And I heard no immediately response from the captain after my query. I wasn't sure if there was an instrumentation error on my flight instrument displays. Was this an unusual airspeed indication problem? And was confused about how he was responding to the increase in airspeed and the flap and the aircraft pitch attitude. Very shortly after calling flaps five, the captain announced flaps one. I selected flaps one and noticed our airspeed continued to increase as the yoke moved forward pitching the nose down and the thrust stayed at a climb power setting with the captain overriding the thrust levers slightly. I glanced over to cross check the captain's PFD flight display and his handling. Instantly after looking over, I sensed a cloud movement out of the forward window indicating a cloud breakout. In other words, he, I believe he saw the ocean. I instantly recognized the severity of our situation, looked down and noticed our airspeed 20 to 30 knots past the flap limit speed. With the altimeter falling and the pitch around minus eight to minus 10 degrees nose down, I announced pull up, pull up, pull up, pull up many times as the jip whiz enunciated as well. So both the jip whiz and the FO are hollering pull up. The captain then brought the yoke aft increasing our pitch angle pulled the thrust to idle then as the aircraft began a positive pitch trend the captain increased the thrust to maximum and called flaps up performing an escape maneuver again that's 20 degrees nose high with full power speed brakes retracted at the same moment i checked the speed brakes and heard terrain terrain pull up pull up as our descent stopped and reversed the trend around 800 feet on the radar altimeter our pitch increased to over 20 degrees nose up and our airspeed trend reversed and then we held about 230 knots as our VFIE limit went to the flaps up normal limit. Once we got around the weather and up to cruise, we debriefed the departure in the event. The captain said he never announced flaps 15 but asked for flaps 5 twice. So there's the beginning of the unraveling of this entire event indicating a miscommunication on our flap retraction. The captain said he was focused on the flap setting and was looking at our ICAST, that's the engine indication crew alerting system, waiting for a flap malfunction to appear and was unaware of our pitch attitude until I queried him. So the miscommunication led the captain to believe there was a malfunction with the flaps and he was distracted from flying the aircraft by looking over to start investigating a possible flap malfunction. The captain said he did pitch forward, but didn't think he pitched forward enough to cause such a dramatic pitch change and concluded we must have had a wind shear or a downdraft. Now this is the part where I think, did the captain just recently come off of the Airbus aircraft uh, back onto the Boeing 777? Because the Airbus, with its, again, with its uh, joystick controller versus the Boeing aircraft and its yoke style control do handle different and do trim different using their fly-by-wire flying systems. Going over the aircraft data recorder provided for in the report, first line we have the altitude, both barometric and radio altitude, since this was over water they pretty well align and they show a climb up to 2,000 feet and then a descent down to 748 feet before the climb was initiated. The next line here shows the flap limit speed in red starting with flaps 1 over here at about 255 knots, flaps 5, flaps 15 which was held for a while and flaps 20. So the speed's building up and then we have a overspeed at the flaps 5 setting right about here. The next line shows the flap handle position and the flap position. Again, here's flaps 20, corresponds with these speed limits up here, 
flaps 20, flaps 15, which they held for a good long time, then pretty quickly flaps 5, flaps 1, and then flaps up. Now here we have the pitch attitude of the aircraft versus the pitch command on the yoke. So the aircraft is climbing up and then starts this descent. And down here in this tiny little squiggly line is the pitch command. And he's pulling up, 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 then nudges, just slightly nudges, nose down. But that gets the aircraft heading down at a good rate of descent. Then he brings the yoke back towards neutral, but he's still heading down because the aircraft is trimmed. The aircraft is doing exactly what the pilot uh, is requesting from it, especially with his pitch and power setting. That's the way Boeing aircraft fly. Then there's another nose down nudge right here. And that big nudge right there from the yoke is what drives this, this pitch attitude down to nearly 10 degrees nose low, more than 10 degrees. Briefly more than 15 degrees nose low before the aircraft is pulled up and they begin the sea fit or control flight into train recovery procedure, which is to raise the nose to 20 degrees, nose high, full power, speed brakes retracted. And that's where the passengers felt the high G load of the aircraft doing the roller coaster ride away from the ocean. Now it's taken me nearly 30 minutes to explain this so far, but with Kellen's help, we were able to get a rough simulation in MS 2020, Boeing 777 program, just to give you a rough idea of how quick this unraveled. All right, park and brake off. Toga, bring the power up. Thrust set. A little left crosswind. Do you remember your call out, Kellen? 80. Checked. Call it right when it happens. We didn't turn the flight directors off. Let's let's leave the flight directors on and see. Uh, turn the flight director off, please. Okay, we're climbing away and we are accelerating to our next flap up speed. Gear up. Pause rate gear up. Okay, show them the flap up speed of flaps five. I call for flaps five, but instead I get flaps fifteen. Now look over and see what's going on with the flaps. And I go flaps five. We argued about it a bit. Get flaps five. Now I'm in the overspeed and I've managed to get the nose pointed down. Flaps one, power off. We break out of the weather. We see the ocean below. Recover from a full CFIT recovery. Nose up, power up, 20 degrees nose high, and recover. And that's when the high G event happens to the passengers. Get the aircraft safely climbing away from the terrain and recover from that. Recover from that. So that's just how quick all that happens. Okay, 1800. So the view from the outside of the aircraft, it was not until they saw this view of the clouds rushing by and a glimpse of the ocean right about here they realized it's sea fit recover flaps up nose up 20 degrees full power and escape yeah and the jip whiz would be hollering at you the whole time so it was that quick view of the ocean that cued the crew into realizing exactly what problem this clearly was. It was clearly a CFIT problem. It was not a flap malfunction. It was not an unreliable airspeed situation. It was not a wind shear problem. It was a CFIT problem. And out of the Rolodex, they pulled out the right procedure, 20 degrees nose high, full power escape. And that's what brought the high G onset for everybody on board the aircraft. So I hope this gives you a better understanding of the NTSB final report on United's Flight 1722 departing Maui last December 
and is a good reminder for all of us of how a simple distraction during a critical phase of flight can quickly lead to an undesirable aircraft state. Thank you so much for your support, especially the folks over on Patreon that make this content possible. See you here.